Okay, so good morning, everyone. It is a great, great pleasure to open this event today with our fifth talk of the year. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, the audience, for being here today. And of course, a big thank you to my colleague, Charlie Newman, who accepted the invitation. I know she has a lot to do, so, but thank you very much, Charlene, for uh, having accepted to share your expertise with us here today, okay? So, um, uh, Charlene and I, in fact, I have to say this, we met in back in 2000. <laughs> And Marcel just uh, left, who gave a talk two months ago, right? And I have to make this public. I have to thank Charlene because she was really a big help in the lab with all the processing of the fMRI data, with all the crazy things for me, new things. So I have to thank you, Charlene, here in public. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the help. <laughs> Okay, so um, it is, this event, of course, is celebrating all this collaboration and partnership uh, that Nucleo de Estudos en Litura, the one I coordinate, right? And with all these researchers, and as you know, right, it is also celebrating the PGE's uh, 50th anniversary. So PTGI, our graduate program in English, was founded back in 1971. So as I have been saying here, we have a lot to celebrate, right? We have more than 500 and 560 and thesis defended. I think uh, about 180 doctoral defenses. So we do have a lot to celebrate, okay? So this virtual event is organized by uh, NEL, Núcleo de Estudos em Leitura, under my coordination, and GEM, Grupo de Estudos em Neurolinguística e Psicolinguística, coordinated by Lilian Cristina Ubner, with the support, of course, of Programa de Pós-Graduação em Inglês, PTGI, and OSTI, okay? So, uh, I'll just say a, a few words here, of course, uh, Charlene uh, Newman is this very respected researcher, neuroscientist, and we would have a lot to say about her career, but uh, she's a cognitive neuroscientist in the Department of Psychology at the University of Alabama. She's also the executive director of the Alabama Life Research Institute. And her research seeks um, to explain how cognition emerges from networks of brain regions. And the cognitive domains in which she focuses are language comprehension and problem solving. Uh, she has helped clarify functional distinctions between brain regions involved in sentence comprehension, strengthening earlier interpretations of the functional roles assigned to different brain regions, and providing strong empirical support for a particular theoretical model of sentence comprehension. So I'm sure uh, her talk is going to be very um, enriching and um, is going to give us lots of insights. Yes, so Charlene, I give you the floor. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, we are all going to close our cameras now so that the focus is Charlene, okay? So I, I have to thank Lena um, for inviting me. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to dual task and the older I get, the harder that becomes uh, <laughs> for, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, 
she gave me maybe a little too much credit. I think we we supported each other in in Marcel's lab. I learned a lot from her, um, and so I, I I do thank you for for that experience and being so kind to me um, in Marcel's lab. Um, so I I'm gonna. As Lena mentioned, my, most of my research has been focused on sentence level processing, looking at syntactic and semantic um, processing at the at the sentence level. Um, so, but I've been sort of pulled into the, the study of, of second language um, processing or um, and bilingualism by graduate students um, as well as some some colleagues, and and I think I mean it's been fascinating for me, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how. The brain accommodates um, multiple languages, and really, I mean, two is what we st study. Um, and I'm going to sort of just start by saying that I'm not going to really be able to answer this question, um, but um, it's, it's something that I, I thought would be interesting to talk about. Um, and I also, you know, I've already said that it's not been where I've spent most of my time in studying second language um, processing, but it is, um, I think, something that that is of interest to me and I, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to pursue more and maybe get some graduate students or postdocs interested. That's how I've been able to sort of study lots of different things. Um, I, I wanna start by, with the acknowledgements. Um, the work I'm gonna present, um, a lot of it is one of my former graduate students, Josh Williams. Um, and so I'll be talking a lot about like American Sign Language. Um, all of that's his work. And so I wanna make sure he gets credit for that. Uh, um, and my other collaborators on, on this work, um, Eleanor um, Rossi and Judith Kroll, um, the MR physicists at Indiana University, which is where I was um, in 2019 and between like 2004 and 2019, um, Hu Chang, and Isabel Darcy, who's another collaborator at Indiana. And then the army of undergraduates who, <laughs> who helped with data collection um, for everything you're, you're gonna see. I always have to acknowledge um, my daughter, Morgan. I think the last time Lena saw Morgan, she may have been like three <laughs> or four. Um, and so she, this is when she graduated from college and my, my parents. Um, so they're, they're the people who keep me sane. Um, and so I have to, have to thank them. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm gonna try to, to, to um, talk about today, I want to first start with my hypotheses and the implications for those hypotheses in, in terms of um, second language processing um, and L2 learning. Um, and then talk a little bit about the effect of L2 learning on cognition and brain. And then I just threw in a couple of, of studies that I thought were, <laughs> were interesting um, at the end, looking at how L2 is, is processed. Um, okay, so. My hypotheses are where, where I sit um, after, and I think it's, it may also be important just to understand like where, my, my sort of career trajectory. So all of my degrees are in engineering. I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. I focused on medical imaging. So I came into cognitive neuroscience as a postdoc in, in Marcel's lab. Um, at that time, I mean, everything about language is that language and, and linguists still, and you know, if anyone's a linguist, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but what I'm about to say, um, but, but there is this, has been for a long time, this idea that language is, is special, that it's this sort of um, uh, process that's different from the rest of cognition and that there are these sort of specialized processing units in the brain that, that just do language um, processing. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the, the work by Paul Broca and, um, and Wernicke sort of supports that, right? So a lot of the, the aphasia work, um, at least early on, supported this idea that there are these sort of specialized sort of processing modules for, for language. Um, the more that I've learned and the more imaging studies that I have performed, um, the less I believe that. So language is not special. Um, is not any different than the rest of cognition. Um, it's like the rest of cognition and then it emerges from the sort of interconnected, highly dynamic neurocognitive system, right? So it, 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 it strongly interacts with working memory and attention and, and these other um, cognitive processes. So I just don't, I, I'm not a believer that language is somehow special. I, I'm also not necessarily, I think the way we define 
the way linguists have defined language, it sort of makes it something that only humans um, have, but other animals have really complex communication systems that's not that different from language, right? And so, and those communication systems emerge from their sort of neurocognitive um, system. And so their interconnected system. And so it's different because those brains are different and, and those systems are different. Um, and, and so, and I also believe that, that the neurocognitive system is dynamic um, and it adaptively changes as a function of its interactions with the environment. So the inner, then what you're exposed to helps mold your neurocognitive system, right? And when you're processing information, um, that, that's experience that changes how you process that information the next time, right? So um, if, you, if you take a look across, let's say just an fMRI study, how subjects process the first stimulus is different than how it processes the second, third, fifth, and fourth. So they, they learn from each exposure and the, the network changes slightly as, as you get more experience. Um, and I've seen this across a number of studies where, where subjects will, after a, some exposure to, to your stimuli, they develop alternative strategies for performing your task because they're learning. And then the brain activation completely changes, right? And so the system is dynamic and is designed to accomplish the task that's in front of it. So um, that activation is not static. And again, the environment changes what, what that looks like. Additionally, individual differences in, in, in cognitive ability influences how that ad, adaptation takes place. Um, it, or whether, or, or, well, I'm not gonna say whether because I think it still changes, but it does change how. Um, and, it, and those differences in individual differences do account for differential learning outcomes um, across individuals. So what are the implications for, for how I view <laughs> um, how the brain works? Um, and one is that, is that L2, in terms of L2 learning, um, L2 learning alters the neurocognitive system, right? So when you learn a second language, you change your, your, um, the, your cognition <laughs> and you change your brain, right? Um, and so, and so that there are factor, cognitive factors that can, and there are cognitive, cognitive factors that can predict L2 learning. So this idea about these individual differences um, impacting how that your brain changes. Um, so that means that there are these individual differences, there are cognitive factors that can predict how well you learn an, a second language. Um, and of course, learning that language affects cognition. Um, L2 learning also alters brain structure as well as functioning. Um, and, you know, there, there is a relationship, the, well, the relationship between your first language and the second language that you're learning um, affects the changes, right? And so how much your brain has to change to accommodate that second language um, is important for determining how the brain is going to change, right? So um, that's another, I'm not actually going to touch on that one, but this, it's a hypothesis that, um, that, I, that I've developed over time. Um, so just to introduce you a bit to what most of the, of the um, results I'm gonna show you are, are based on, is based on one particular study. Um, and this is what the study that, that um, Josh Williams did um, during his time um, in graduate school at, at IU, one of the things that he did. Um, and so in this study, we were interested in, in um, bimodal bilinguals um, and, and how your brain and your neurocognitive system needs to, to change to accommodate um, this um, manual lang language. So in this case, American Sign Language, right? And so we recruited both um, American Sign Language, so ASL students and Spanish students in intro classes. Um, and there are of course differences significant differences in, in what you need to learn and, and um, accommodate when you're learning a sign language versus another auditory language, if, you're, if your L1 is an auditory language, right? So um, sign language is visual spatial um, in, in nature. 
And so you have to adjust to, uh, to um, perceiving language information um, like simultaneously. So this sort of parallel kind of input of, of language where auditory stimuli is serial in nature. So you go from serial to parallel, you go from auditory to visual and visual spatial because where the sign is, is um, created in space matters. Um, and so you have to pay attention to not just the, the configuration of the hands, but where those hands are located when that configuration happens, plus movement, right? And so, cause the movement also, also matters. Um, and so, and we're not necessarily that great at doing that kind of visual spatial processing. Um, and it takes time to adjust and learn how to, how to attend to that information. And it takes some time to adjust to like your visual spatial um, working memory, right? Because we're used to serial information, we're used to auditory information. And so when you're learning an, a second auditory language, you don't have to make those types of accommodations. But what you do have to do is adjust to the differences in, in just the auditory input, right? The speech sounds are different across different languages. And adjusting to those speech sounds are, is something that you, you have to adjust to and producing those, those speech sounds are different. So again, what, what you have to learn and what your brain has to accommodate is different for a sign language versus um, a second auditory language. And so we were interested in, in how that happens, the differences in how, how you learn those two different types of languages. Um, now, we also sort of believe that once you adjust to the differences in the sensory input, and you get to language, then the language parts process the same, right? But everything before you get there, but all the sort of interpreting those signals, that's different. But we, we, we sort of had the hypothesis that the language part would be the same. Um, so we assess these um, participants, like within the first two weeks of the semester, at the end of the first semester, and then at the end of the second semester of either ASL or Spanish, depending on what what course they were in. Um, they performed a perceptual task um, in the scanner um, at each of these time points. Um, so there was a, an ASL condition where the um, par participants saw an, a native signer produce signs and their task was just to respond whether or not the sign was made uh, like on the head or face, right? So. Um, and that was a task. It was just, where was the sign um, made? In Spanish, um, again, a native Spanish speaker produced words and um, the participants sort of saw the, <laughs> of course, the, 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 the speaker and had to respond whether or not the word was produced with a lip closure or not, right? And so it had nothing to do with whether or not, well, what the sign was or what the word was. It was all about um, sort of the visual perceptual aspects right and so and that was done because the the um during the first two weeks of the semester that they didn't know any sign language and they didn't know any spanish right so we couldn't ask them about what the content of what they were producing um but that also makes it so that the activation differences that you see from time point one two and three um or in this case we use t0 t1 and t2 um that those differences are, are due to the participants learning these languages, right? Not to the task. Um, the tasks were like super simple. So there wasn't a huge concern about habituation. And so we, we just thought that those, that was like the best task for looking at what we were looking at. Um, so the participants completed a battery of assessments um, and they also um, performed this perceptual task in the scanner. So we did, we collected fMRI data um, we also collected diffusion data, so deep, some DTI data and, and anatomical data. Um, hopefully you can, <laughs> you can see these figures. And so first looking at the, the cognitive predictors of L2 learning. So there's a lot of uh, research um, out there that um, shows that there's a relationship between working memory, um, the L1 vocabulary, um, attentional processes, um, and and maybe some others that aren't coming to mind right now. 
um, that do predict L2 learning. Um, most, of, most if not all of that work is focused on uh, um, an auditory L2, um, like the L1 is auditory, but they all show um, that there are these cognitive factors that predict how well someone learns their second language, right? Um, and, and we sort of found similar results looking at ASL, right? So we saw some differences between what predicts ASL versus what predicts Spanish, but we did see a correlation between um, the di four digit span at, at time zero, um, correlating with ASL vocabulary after the end of the first semester. So you see um, a change there. So the higher um, the, the four digit span, the more words they had learned in ASL um, at the end of the first semester. Um, we also saw with visual spatial working memory using the Corsi um, block tapping task um, that for the backward digit span, um, there was a correlation between backward um, Corsi block tapping and vocabulary um, size. But the forward, there wasn't a huge difference, but there was a difference um, again with, I guess I should show you my thing here. <laughs> there was a difference for backwards, but uh, a correlation with backwards, but not for um, coursey block tapping. And then with um, the, the English, the L1 um, uh, picture vocabulary task, so the vocabulary task, you also see a correlation between English vocabulary at um, T0, so at the beginning of the first semester, and ASL vocabulary um, at T1, so at the end of that first semester. Right, so again, we're showing that, the, that there are these cognitive factors that predict um, how well participants learn their, their second language. Um, but again, there were differences, right, between the Spanish and ASL in terms of what predicted. So for example, um, we saw that listening span was positively correlated with ASL proficiency, but it wasn't correlated with Spanish proficiency. And why is not at all clear, um, but there, there were some differences there that would need to be replicated, which is why I don't want to spend too much time on these differences, because I think they they need to be replicated in another, another sample. Any, okay. Um, so neurocognitive um, factors that predict L2. Um, this sort of was a, I don't want to say it was a surprise, but it was a surprise. <laughs> it wasn't somewhat of a surprise to me um, to focus on this dry atom. Um, and I learned again, this is why, you know, I love having graduate students who pull me in different directions because I before you know working with Josh, I hadn't thought about the, the role of this dry atom in um, in language processing. Um, and but what we found here is that the the striatum, both the, the caudate um, nucleus and the putamen um, predicted. ASL vocabulary um, at the, the end of the first semester, right? And so um, it turns out that the striatum has been linked to phonological processing, right? So there are studies that have shown that um, damage to the striatum um, is linked to deficits in sequencing articulatory gestures, right? And so, and there's a lot of work that's connecting um, articulatory gestures to phonological processing. Um, especially like segmentation processing um, related to phonological processing. So, and the striatum has been found to have direct influences on the superior temporal gyrus um, when participants are, are processing phonological information, right? So the putamen um, is, is linked to, to phonological processing, but it appears that it may be linked to phonology through this articulation um, process. Um, and it should be noted that there's articulation in ASL, like there's articulation in, in auditory languages, it's just the articulators are different. But the, the, the articulation process is, is similar, right? Um, so there's been some suggestion that the Putamen might function as a gateway to language proficiency, right? Because if you can't segment the, the, the phonemes, the sounds, um, in an auditory language or segment uh, um, the visual spatial um, gesturing, then it becomes difficult to really kind of uh, to, to process that language. Um, and there's 
um, we see what we found here is that there's a relationship between how how well the putamen or, or how efficiently the the, the striatum, um, both the caudate and the putamen, um, processed the, those that information at T zero. Um, was a, was related to how well they learned um, ASL um, over the course of the semester, right? And again, um, we hypothesize that this is because um, whether you're processing those um, stimuli, those perceptual stimuli as language or not, you still have to segment um, the information so that you can determine whether um, the information was was the, that the sign was produced at the face or um, the lips sort of closed or not. So you still have to perform that segmentation. You still have to identify um, these different gestures. Um, and, and that is what is important and is linked to this vocabulary um, knowledge at T0. Um, so, and, and just additional sort of information. We also found that the activation in these regions were correlated with English um, vocabulary, with their L1 vocabulary at T0. Um, so again, supporting this role for the region and language proficiency, proficiency more generally. Um, so again, I think for, for me, what this sort of showed me is that one is that language, re that, that regions that impact language aren't language specific regions, right? And so in this case, we're talking about the Cauda and Putainment, who regions that we have linked to motor processing, and we're still linking to motor processing in terms of articulatory gesture, um, and its relationship to phonological processing, but that these processes are intimately sort of linked together. Okay, so um, we talked about how cognition impacts L2 learning um, and neurocognitive processing impacting L2 learning. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how learning in L2 alters cognition. Right. And so, and there's a lot of, of, of research out there looking at this sort of bi bilingual advantage, right? We are both early and late bilinguals um, have, um, one is easier for them to learn another language compared to monolinguals. Um, there's a lot of research suggesting that they have better cognitive control um, processing, particularly inhibitory control um, processing and that they they have an advantage in phonetic um, processing, right? So there's work that shows that lear having learned multiple languages alters cognition in these particular cognitive tasks, right? Um, and so one of the, the sort of interesting things to think about is that all of this work has been focused on learning a second auditory language or most of that work has been focused on, on learning a second auditory language. But what about if you're, if you're learning um, a manual language? So now you're a bimodal bilingual, do you have the same um, bilingual advantages is a question that, that, that we had. Um, again, there are differences, right? So when that, it, in some ways it makes sense that you may have better cognitive control if you're if you have two auditory languages because you can only speak one at a time, right? So you have to suppress one in order to produce the other, right? But that's not true when you you're a bimodal bilingual. You can speak and sign at the same time, right? So that you so that then we thought well you may not have this sort of increased um, inhibitory control processing ability, right? So but what do you do you see? The other thing is, is that a lot of bimodal bilinguals, again, they do speak um, the same time they sign, but also people, when they sign, they mouth, even if they're not speaking. And so the, the, um, the way the mouth moves facilitates the comprehension of the sign, right? So, so you're, you're looking at lots of things when you're, you're um, when you're signing. Another is that, is that the, so we, we, we wanted to look at audiovisual processing uh, because you're, 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 you're able to one, do both and people do a lot of kind of lip reading because you have to sort of pay attention to the mouthing as well as the signing. And so we did this study, uh, behavioral study, um, looking at audiovisual processing where we had just an audio signal, just a visual signal, 
and then the audiovisual um, signal comparing ASL learners um, to Spanish L2 learners. Um, and what we found were differences across these two where um, for the audio only, um, there were no differences between the two groups. Um, but when visual was included, um, then the ASL group outperformed the, the lip reading with just the visual um, information. Of course, you know, people aren't great lip readers. And so their, um, their accuracy was lower for just the visual compared to just the auditory, but ASL still outperformed the Spanish L2 learners. And then the audio visual, um, ASL still outperformed um, the, the Spanish L2 learners. So there does appear to be um, the sort of visual advantage um, for bimodal bilinguals um, compared to um, learning to, to auditory languages. We also had this hypothesis, although we haven't tested it, um, that bimodal bilinguals may be better multitaskers because they are having to coordinate the speech and the signing at the same time. So they're having to perform a dual task because most of them do speak and sign at the same time. So they're performing this kind of dual tasking thing. Um, as well as better sort of spatial processing uh, more generally because signing is requires a lot of visual spatial kind of and spatial processing. Although I think we, we may have sort of taken a look at that and seen some hints at it, but we didn't pursue it as much as we, we wanted to. Josh graduated and so he was the only one doing <laughs> the ASL um, work. And so it kind of stopped when he left. Um, <clears throat> So now how does the brain accommodate an L2? What happens when you're to, to brain as you're learning an L2? Um, and so we, we took a look at functional connectivity, um, looking at the, the T0 so before the semester and then T1 at the end of the, the first semester. Um, and we use this partial least squares um, connectivity analysis to take a look comparing those two. And what we found um, is that when you compare the two, um, so before, what you see it for T, 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 at T1 at the end of the semester is that there's less connectivity, um, inter-hemispheric connectivity at T1 compared to T0, right? Um, and, at, and greater sort of um, left hemisphere intra-connectivity, and this is left and this is right. Oh, this is left <laughs> and this is right. This is left and this is right hemisphere. Um, and so you see more language-like, more left dominant, more left um, inter, intra hemispheric connectivity at T1 compared to T0. Um, again, and you get this sort of decrease. The other really interesting thing is you see this correlation um, between <clears throat> the expression of this more language-like network um, and changes in vocabulary score or what the vocabulary score is, right? So the more language-like the, the connectivity is um, at T1, the greater the vocabulary, um, ASL vocabulary score. So <clears throat> again, what you're, which is what we were hoping for, right? So is that, that once you, you've adjusted to the, the input and you're focusing on language, then the information is processed like language. Um, so that's kind of what we, what we saw there. We also see um, gray matter changes, and there's a lot of work looking at um, the impact of, of structural um, gray matter changes when you learn in generally, um, but when you learn a second language in particular. Um, and so there, there are a few reviews um, that, that show this. And so again, we replicated that, those same kind of studies um, looking at ASL learners. And so after two semesters, um, we do see gray matter volume increases um, as measured by voxel-based morphometry, where we see the cerebellum and primary motor cortex actually showed some, some increases. Um, again, uh, I, if, you, if you've never um, watched people sign um, and really sort of pay attention to the visual spatial processing that's required, um, it's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of hard, hard work to sort of over, 
overcome that learning curve is a, is a steep learning curve is what I'll say. Um, and so seeing the cerebellum, seeing these motor regions impacted by learning ASL, um, we thought was, was fascinating. Um, and then of course, th there were also language processing uh, regions um, like the supermarginal gyrus and middle temporal gyrus that we also saw increases in gray matter volume um, after two semesters of, of learning ASL. Um, we also saw white matter changes. Um, so we, with the diffusion data, we, we found, and again, there are a number of studies that have also looked at white matter um, changes as a function of learning a, a second language. Um, and we saw the same. In this case, we, we found differences um, in the anterior body of the corpus callosum, anterior mid body of the corpus callosum. Um, and this other data is from Eleonora's um, 2017 study looking at um, monolinguals compared to late um, bilinguals. And so, and, and she, we found similar results, although not in the, the corpus callosum, but in, in other um, white matter tracts. And so this is kind of hard to see, but the red shows the differences between um, the monolinguals and bilinguals. You can see um, red in some of the, these um, important sort of language tracts in the um, bilaterally, but mostly in the left hemisphere. Um, and the interesting thing with, with the study, with the Eleonora study, is that we, we also found a correlation between age of acquisition um, and F fractional anisotropy, which is a, a measure obtained from diffusion um, imaging that is, is linked to white matter integrity. And so again, learning a second language impacts gray matter as well as white matter. Um, this isn't surprising again, that because learning any new thing changes gray matter <laughs> and white matter. And so learning language, um, a second language does as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna sort of move to, to talking about a, like two studies, two studies I think that um, I just thought were, were interesting to touch on. Um, I'll warn you in advance, the, the code switching, the language switching is not my area. Um, this is an Eleonora um, study um, that I worked with her on. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting um, topic um, that probably is a bit understudied with imaging. Um, and so, one of the things that we were we were interested in, and we had we, that has been discussed quite a bit in the in the um, bilingual um, world, is um, this idea of the language as being active. Um, is one active and the other suppressed? Um, there's a cost to to suppressing, so there's resources that are required to suppress a language, um, and there are resources that are required. There's a cost to bringing that language back um, to the the forefront, right? And so, and and Judith Kroll, I mean, she's spent quite a bit of her career focused on on these control processes in terms of uh, and the impact of suppression, suppressing a language, and and that kind of thing. And so. Um, at the time, Eleonora was in was a postdoc in Judith's lab, and so we 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 designed this code switching um, study because um, frequent code switchers, these sort of habitual code switchers, it's clear that both languages are active at the same time, right? Because otherwise, you can't just sort of switch between them in the middle of a sentence, right? Um, and so we were just kind of interested to see whether or not there was a cost. Uh, for habitual code switchers to, to code switch. Um, and so that was the real question for this study. And so we examined 29 Spanish, um, so Spanish L1, English L2 bilinguals who were habitual code switchers. So they switched code switch regularly every day. Um, and we also were interested in looking at different types of code switches. Um, so, and this is where, you know, this is not my area. And so I can't really speak to the reasoning behind um, why switches tend to happen more frequently at the verb phrase boundary, as opposed to the noun, noun phrase boundary. Um, but that was of interest to Eleanor. So we, we included these two different types of switches, again, at the noun or the verb phrase boundary. Um, and again, the verb phrase boundary switch is more frequent. Um, so just the fact that one is more frequent than the other, you should 
expect differences in activation between them um, if for no other reason based on frequency of exposure, right? Um, and so it was, it, but we were interested to see where um, that activation was. And then we also had um, non-switch conditions. So an English um, non-switch condition um, and then a Spanish non-switch condition is like baseline. I think, um, so the interesting thing here is that the habitual code switchers um, do engage the sort of general control network. So they do show greater activation for the switches, the switch conditions compared to the non-switch conditions. And they show these, these differences in like the anterior cingulate cortex, which is linked to um, inhibitory control processing. So even though they're habitual switchers and they do it all the time, there's still a cost to doing it. Um, so of course, now the question is, well, if there's a cost to doing it, why are they doing it? Um, and that part's just not, not completely clear. Um, and as expected, there are differences between the switches that happen at the verb phrase boundary versus the noun phrase boundary. Um, and that activation difference was primarily located in like the fusiform um, region. So again, it, 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 this was somewhat of a surprise to me that it would be located in, in a region um, that's focused mostly on, on um, like object memory or semantic kinds of, of processing. Um, but that's where we saw these differences. Then the second study is one from um, another graduate student who I worked with in, in my lab, um, Sophia um, Rommel, who did this study. She was a, a Spanish major um, and a cognitive a Spanish and cognitive science major at Indiana. Um, and she was interested in, um, in speech and noise, right? So, um, and that's because, I mean, when you're a not, when you're a native speaker and you're trying to, to have a conversation and hear people um, in a crowd, it can be difficult, right? Um, but you have enough knowledge of your L1 that you can kind of fill in where you miss some things or, um, it, it's a little easier to, to make out what's being said. But if you're a non-native speaker, um, perceiving in these sort of adverse listening conditions and this noise um, has been like into a sort of a dual task, a dual challenge, right? Where you have an imperfect signal because it's your non-native language. And so you have to work harder to just process that signal um, and, and imperfect knowledge because you just don't know the language well enough to make these predictions about what someone is saying, right? So it's a, a difficult, it's a challenge. Um, and so in this study, we, we had 18 advanced Spanish um, students and they performed the hearing and noise test, the HINT, as well as the Latin American HINT um, with various noise levels. So we did this in the scanner and the way we um, set this task up is that the, the auditory stimuli were, we had sparse, we used sparse imaging where the auditory stimuli was presented when the scanner was silent so that there wasn't additional noise on top of the noise <laughs> uh, levels that we were already trying to, um, to study. So that, that alone was a, a challenge that um, Hu Chang, our physicist, helped us overcome, um, but we were able to, to do that. Um, and what, what we found was, was that for the English condition, um, so again, these were English, Spanish. Um, well, they were Spanish learners. I mean, we can have a whole conversation about what bilingual means. And so we, we stuck with Spanish learners in English as their L1. Um, so what we found were sort of differences, of course, between um, processing the information, the, the stimuli and noise versus silence um, or versus non-noise, I should say. And um, we also found that English well, way, the way we interpreted the results is that English and noise resulted in more top-down processing, right? So we see um, processing of executive um, functioning kinds of regions, um, and English is the sort of the yellow. So you see this anterior cingulate um, activation, and you, there's also some inferior frontal gyrus activation where 
we interpreted this as, as that the, the participants were able to kind of fill in or um, predict um, what was being said in noise. Um, whereas the Spanish, for the Spanish condition, you see more perceptual processing. Um, so you see more auditory um, and secondary auditory processing um, as well as motor processing. So like the, um, the supplementary motor area as well as bangle, basal ganglia um, area that we interpreted as more bottom up trying to um, think about how the, the stimulus was produced to determine what was being said, right? So again, what we hypothesize is English was using more of a top-down language knowledge to help um, uncover what was being said in noise where the L2 was more of a bottom-up kind of process trying to understand um, understand what was being said based on, on gestures or based on um, trying to, to clean up that auditory signal. Um, and the, the analogy I like to give, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but I've been in this situation several times when I'm communicating with someone who's not a non-native English speaker because I only speak English. Um, a lot of times what happens is you sort of zoom in on their mouth, on the articulators um, to try to, to, to decode what's being said, right? So, you, you use all of that sort of, again, bottom up because you don't have the top-down information to help you um, uncover what's being, what's being said. Um, so that's the, the last study. So just to kind of summarize, um, again, hopefully th that what these studies show is, is that language isn't special and that you have regions across the brain that are engaged in language processing, um, not just Broca's area and Wernicke's area, um, and that they're all important to language learning and to language processing. Um, and so language is one of the many cognitive uh, processes um, or cognitive functions that involve the number of processes, right? Um, also that the neurocognitive cognitive system is um, dynamic and changes, and it changes all across the sort of lifespan, right? So as you learn, you change your neurocognitive system. Um, so, and it's a function of the environment. So it's a function of the languages that you're learning. It's a function of how you're learning those languages, which we, we didn't, I didn't touch on at all here, right? So um, there are some studies that show learning, being immersed in the environment versus not being immersed in the environment that impacts how you learn and it impacts these, the, the way the neurocognitive system changes, right? And individual differences, I think this is um, from, the experience and, and, and Marcel's lab, right? So, so and the, the heavy focus, at least at that time on, on individual differences, um, individual differences matter, right? So in, individual differences in, in cognition, they, they matter and they have an, an impact on, on how the brain changes um, and the learning outcomes. Um, and so understanding that I think, um, and more focus on that I think would be, um, worthwhile to do. Okay, so that's I have. Are there okay. any questions? Oh my goodness. I would like to see faces so so people think I'm giving these talks like when you have no one to look at it. I'm still not used to. Oh my goodness. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Something happened here with technology and I could not find the screen. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Charlene. My goodness. So many questions popping up. <laughs> Thank you for the very, very nice talk. Um, and thank you for making something that uh, for an audience who's not really into so much into fMRI and neuroimaging and all that. I think um, you were able to make it uh, somehow very understandable, so thank you for that too. Uh, 
I do have some questions. So I think I'm going to ask, begin by asking one of my questions, which is more general. Then um, I'm just going to pick up some of the questions here. And, okay, so this way the focus is not just me. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Charlene, I think my first question is more general, uh, just for the audience to understand. Um, it is related to, for example, um, fMRI began in mid 90s. I think the first lab is from 1995, first publication, 1995, 1996, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you could tell us, and we worked together 10 years ago, and I remember in my study, I lost like half of the participants because of motion artifacts. So being in the scanner, for some time, any movement, even heartbeat, or right? Move your brain. And then I know uh, during this time, there have been uh, some programs to correct this motion, but still, I saw that in your, this Eleonora said in your lab, right? This study on code switching, you also lost some participants because of motion artifact. So uh, my question is, what has fMRI brought in terms of um, strengthening research, especially language, related mm -hmm. to language, right? Uh, that without fMRI, we could not have this, right? And what are still shortcomings? For example, um, we have a lot more studies, I think still today, right? Uh, on reading, on language processing, listening, and not so many studies with speaking. And I don't know of any studies with writing, which would be something very nice to know about, right? Right. So in relation to the scanner itself, because uh, maybe this has changed. I think it has, but maybe you can tell us if something more modern has come. And today, for example, if you are investigating language processing, you don't have to be inside the scanner for the whole body. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what are some advances in relation to because of this technology, we can do this. And what are still some of the short things? This would so I'll start with the beginning. And so, and that is what has, has MRI sort of what have we learned from MRI that we couldn't have learned otherwise? And I would say during my so I started in 97, 96 um, doing doing MRI and, and my first studies were it were actually related to language processing um, in, in grad school. And I will say that for me, what's changed is in the beginning, um, everything was based on, on damage, right? So everything was based on, on stroke and patients. And, and, and so what we knew about language was based on people with deficits. It wasn't based on normal, and I hate the word normal because I don't know what normal means, but it wasn't based on, <laughs> on people without damage, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and I think a lot of that sort of bred this idea that there's there are these language modules, right? So you get damage to Broca's area and then you have some general deficit, right? But even now, the more, the closer you look, that's not true, right? So, so there are variances and and those deficits, even when you get damaged or broken there, right? So I think what we've learned from imaging is one how how the brain one how different it for me anyway is how different every individual is. 
and and two, what is happening when there is no damage? <laughs> right? um, and I think the thing that that we still kind of overlook is how different each individual is, right? So when you do these studies and you're actually looking at your data, you see that the activation for every person is different. But we average them together and we only talk about the average and we sort of ignore the difference. But that difference matters. <laughs> um, but the problem is we don't know how to process that difference well yet. <laughs> what to do with it. But And I'm looking forward to like new techniques where we can actually look at individuals and how that individual brain activation maps onto that individual cog cognitive profile. And then what we can do at the sort of, and looking at, you know, individuals, which we still aren't really doing. So that's one of the shortcomings is that we still aren't looking at individuals, um, which, is, which is also a, a little annoying because um, like the spatial resolution that MRI has, we can go to, to, to ultra high spatial resolution and, and look at more fine, but then we can't average them across subjects, right? <laughs> because everyone's brain is different, looks different too. I mean, everyone's brain is, is I mean, the, the, just the structure is, is different, but we kind of morph them to fit a space. But if you have that high resolution, you don't want to morph it because then you lose the resolution. Right? So, <laughs> so there are all these other kind of more sort of um, analysis, more technical issues to try to, to, to move forward in that space. Um, and motion is still a problem, right? And so, and, and I still, I like to use the metaphor that I give to kids when I scan them. It's like, we're taking a picture. <laughs> If you move while I'm taking the picture, my picture will be blurry. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's just the way, the way it goes. I mean, if you take a picture and you move, the picture's blurry. And that we can't, we, that's not something we're gonna fix, right? So that's just a feature um, of, of this, of imaging, um, regardless of how the imaging is, is done. Um, but we can do other things. I mean, I think you're right. We've been focused on a particular, Learn, looking at particular things, we haven't, we can do speech in the scanner. And, and we've done a couple of like pilot studies where we've done, actually we've done some studies with, with speech in the scanner where people are, are speaking. You can do it. Um, you have to deal with, with motion and you wanna to try to fix the person's head as much as possible so that there's, you reduce the amount of motion. But the problem is the, is the motion. Um, but I think there are ways to, to overcome that. And there are some people who are better at, at, at talking without their whole heads moving. Um, <laughs> And there, there are these like things you can put on their hands to kind of prevent them from, from moving. So you can, you can do speech. Um, and one of my colleagues in Indiana um, has been doing writing in the, in the scanner. So, um, and, and, and in some ways I miss like being at IU because the psychology department had an electronics and machine shop. And so they worked with her and built an MR compatible iPad. So you can write in the, scan, in the scanner. Um, and she was looking at writing with kids, um, handwriting in kids. So you can, you can do that too. I mean, that's possible to do as well. So now you can do some of these things that were, that were like technically difficult to do before, um, but they are still technically kind of hard to do um, or a challenge, but not impossible. I think the technology has moved to a place where things aren't impossible to do now. Yeah, it's nice to know that. I mean, having all the, the budget and everything, I think this is very much possible, right? Yeah, if you have enough money, you can do almost anything. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to know. And would you say that, um, for example, um, because EEG is, has a, I think, better temporal resolution. So with, depending on the type of study, EEG, electroencephalogram, or even clinical potentials, mm -hmm. more appropriate than fMRI? Oh, for sure, yeah. So when you, yeah, you, sh you should not just do fMRI because you can do fMRI. I mean, it should match your research question, <laughs> right? And so, fMRI has a, has a real big problem with temporal resolution. Um, it, and it's not about the scanner. You can scan faster. That's not the issue. It's what we're measuring, right? So 
we're measuring a hemodynamic response. We're not measuring a neural response. And the hemodynamic response is slow. And so it doesn't matter how fast you sample it, you're sampling something that's slow. <laughs> so, because we can, we, can, we can sample really fast, but that doesn't help you with fMRI because you're measuring something that's slow. <laughs> um, um, and so if you care, if, if your question is about timing, then you do not do fMRI. Um, now there are some, some one, one of my, sort of, I guess she's not current now, she just defended. Um, she, she, we did both EEG and, and MRI. We didn't do it simultaneously, but she did EEG and then we did source localization to, to look at where <laughs> in the brain. So there are ways to, to, to combine because you still have to do like an anatomical scan of the head to do the source localization. So there, there are ways of, of doing the best of both worlds. That and we did for her dissertation, we did the same study in EEG and fMRI and did source localization. <laughs> so so you, can, you can bring them together in, in interesting ways now um, that maybe we weren't doing before. People are doing simultaneous. Um, I'm still a bit skeptical of, of simultaneous, but I think it's gotten better over the past few years and I just haven't followed, um, but it's possible. Okay. So I'm going to take one of the questions here from the audience. Um, Tatiana, correct me if I'm, I didn't get for me the first one. In fact, I cannot really, I don't have the whole name of the person and they are only here. But anyway, <laughs> Tatiana, did, can you find out? Okay. Yes. So, um, the first question is from Bruno de Azevedo. Oh, Can I read it? this is not the one I have here on Zoom. No? From Melissa? Hmm? Melissa, then? When you have mentioned that both languages are active at all times, this is the question I have. Oh, okay. I can't find it. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so... Charlene, the question is, when you mentioned that both languages are active at all times, would you say that there is a system that integrated them like a full repertoire, which according to some researchers, such as Ophelia Garcia, Liu Wei, among others, have argued when talking about translanguaging? Um. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but what I will say is that. Uh, would you like the person to, I don't know if the person is willing to explain, yeah. but maybe if she's willing to open the, the mic and just rephrase. I, mean, I can answer the best I can and if, if. If I'm wrong. I, I could okay. try to clarify, but uh, if you really didn't understand, uh, because okay. uh, my okay. dissertation, thank you too for the opportunity. Uh, my dissertation is about translanguaging. Yeah, so uh, I'm researching about all these uh, ideas. And when I saw that, it, it really highlighted uh, to me, so because they argue that the both uh, they acknowledge the the existence of the languages, yeah, named languages, but they are arguing that uh, all the languages are integrated in one system. Yeah, so I would like to see what you have to okay. share with us about it. Yeah, so I, thank you. I agree i think that the languages are are integrated into a system a single system i think um i think we have to think about how um frequently the languages are used so let's say you have someone who knows four languages right but they only really use two a lot like every day <laughs> so those two languages are likely to be active like more active all the time and the other maybe more sort of dormant right and so and so those two languages, you may end up doing that sort of code switching with or, or having to actively suppress one when you're suppressing the other. I think when, sometimes I think people don't take into account how often or frequently the languages are being used. And, and I think they're, 
they're both highly active when they're used all the time. So like, for example, in the US, when you're in a sort of a Spanish speaking um, environment, their Spanish and their English are used every day, like <laughs> all the time. And so it's really hard to keep their Spanish completely suppressed because it has so much activation because of use. And so, so I think making sure you're thinking about how often they're used as well as how proficient they are in both, as well as, you know, all of these other factors are, are important to consider. Um, and those are the things that we, we, we've had conversations about but haven't studied <laughs> as much as we wanted to. Okay. Did I at, at least touch on your question? Yeah. Mariboni. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, Charlene, the second question is from, from Bruno de Azevedo. Um, and he's saying, I have, I have a question regarding the claim that bilinguals might have an advantage in multitasking. So don't you think that this kind of result might somehow induce people to multitask, especially in situations where multitasking is dangerous, such as driving and texting? Okay. So first, I, I, it, I, I said bimodal bilinguals <laughs> might be better at multitasking. <laughs> so that's first. Um, two, I don't think, well, we all multitask whether we should or shouldn't. I mean, we're, it's just, we, we do. Um, and there are some situations where we shouldn't, and I agree. I don't think it's going to encourage people to multitask. Um, I think people are just going to multitask because that's what people do. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. But I, I do want to clarify, bimodal bilinguals, our hypothesis is that they yeah. are multitasking. Sign language, auditory language. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Bruno. Are you, oh, Bruno is not here. Bruno is on YouTube, so. It's okay. <laughs> um, so Melissa Bittoni is asking a question. Uh, considering neuroplasticity, I was wondering, are changes in brain structure and function from L2 learning greater in children or teenagers learning in L2 compared to adults? You know, I don't know. Um... I don't know if the plasticity, I mean, there's definitely evidence to suggest that kids' brains are more plastic than adults. Um, so there is that, but there's also a lot of evidence to suggest that even in adulthood, um, our brains are still, we, we're st we can still learn. So that means our brains are still plastic, right? So we, we can still learn. Um, I think one of the questions that we, we've, we've discussed quite a bit is like, um, that idea of a critical um, age for language acquisition, right? And so what, what is easier to learn a language before a certain age as opposed to after a certain age? There's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that, um, but the reasons why are, are um, it is sort of up in the air a bit, but I think a lot of it is that learning vocabulary is easy, right? So there's some types of learning that's still <laughs> easy after a certain age and vocabulary learning is one of them. Learning the syntax, learning the accent, learning, <laughs> learning, learning those things are much more difficult. And so there, there may be some areas where there's much less plasticity and other areas where there's still some plasticity, but I think those are some open questions. I would argue that there, that, 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 that there are some areas that there, there's still a lot of plasticity and other areas where there isn't, right? Because just thinking about categorical perception um, and the fact that you know when we're infants we we can we can perceive all the speech sounds and then we only then eventually we can only perceive those like in our language or a subset of them those that we're exposed to right so if you later like me trying to learn Japanese there are sounds in Japanese that I can't I'm not going to be able to distinguish I can't separate them right and so those kinds of things they're just not as plastic. And so I think it just depends on what we're talking about. 
Um, I should also sort of let you guys know I have another meeting. <laughs> Oh, what's, what time is your meeting? Well, now? I told them I was going to be late, but so I mean. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should just wrap up. Um, does the audience have any more questions, Tashan, or have we covered? I will. I will say. I mean, if you if you want to know more, just please don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to. I may it may take me a while to respond, but I will respond. <laughs> So I'll pick up one last question here. In the sense in which we have comparison before and after one semester, how can we be sure the changes are not related to other experiences, not learning the L2, for example? This is from Elisa, again, Victoria. Yeah, um, so I guess we can never be sure of those kinds of things in these types of studies, right? Um, because one, we're averaging across the group, and so we're looking at these sort of group differences. I think, um, one, you feel better about it because you see it in the whole group, and the whole group is experiencing at least this one same thing, and so, and so you can kind of make that inference, um, but I mean, these are always some potential confounds, right, that it may be something else, um, which is why we wanted to compare two different types of learning, like both the ASL and the Spanish, and we wanted to sort of look at them. Um, I will say we had problems with, with dropout. And so um, for the second semester, we lost maybe about half of our subjects because they just, we couldn't get them back into the scanner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so that was difficult. And we lost more Spanish students than we did ASL students, um, which so then we, there was not much we could do with Spanish <laughs> after that. Um, so these kinds of studies are just notorious for those kinds of critiques, but uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. can I say something Linda very briefly yes yes Eileen, it was a great great honor a great pleasure to have you here you were so didactic you know so so many stu studies that you brought to us with uh, uh, bringing also neuroimaging as Linda said we are not very much used to this uh, is from insights uh, from neuroimaging and you brought this in such a simple way with such important studies you know so brilliant research questions like comparing bimodal uh, speakers with uni unimodal uh, and then questioning this language specific mode because we more and more see that one specific area is not related only to one specific linguistic aspect, let's say, but many cognitive resources are involved in, in one specific area, including language. So this is very wonderful that you brought this here so clearly, so uh, simply, although being so complex. And also I liked very much when you brought this issue of individual differences, because statistics solves everything but we see people so different in the scanner. And I study a lot aging, and then it, go, it gets even worse because mm -hmm. the aging brain is even more different. So it's, uh, it's a big challenge to making groups, clusters, yeah, clustering people trying to predict, uh, and also because they have a baggage, a baggage, let's say, a background knowledge, strategies, and right. then this confuses a lot the results and should be observed. So thank you so much, so much for this brilliant talk. Talk, We loved it. Thank it was you. a pleasure hearing to you. Thank you. Yes, Charlie, those are also my words. It's so open and you talk about this in such a natural way that I'm sure the audience was captivated by the subject and who knows, maybe, some are going to ask to be there in your lab <laughs> for some time because our students they have something that we call in Portuguese sandwich, which is some time for for six months or a year they spend uh, abroad and in a lab and carrying out research. This has happened to us, I think, to Lilia, to me, many other people. So, who knows? <laughs> we can talk about that later. So, thank you so much, Charlene. I think we'll let you go, yes? Mm -hmm. And 
Well, if the audience wants to stay just a little bit, just for us to talk, just to give you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is going to happen next? <laughs> You're free to go, okay, Charlene? So Thank you, Charlene. Charlene. Bye bye, Charlene. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I would like oh, to God. very, very, yeah. <laughs> I would like to very briefly then introduce the next topics. Uh, because we have our program up to the 22nd November. So just to make an invitation to, to having again the pleasure of uh, having you here in the next uh, events. So the next one will be on August the 20th with uh, Brandon Weeks from the University of Hong Kong, who is going to talk about writing in contact and in conflict, a wonderful speech a whole history about writing systems. I really encourage you to be here with us in this on August the 20th. And then on September the 15th, we will have Dr. Denise Neumann, Neumann from the University of Auckland. And her talk will be, uh, the title is Antenatal and Perinatal Risk Factors for Receptive Language and Executive Control in Preschool Children. A very interesting talk too. And then on October the 7th, we will have Dr. Regine Kolinsky from the University Libre de Bruxelles from Belgium. And the title is, Does Literacy Impact High Level Cognitive Functions? And finally, the final talk will be on November the 22nd with Dr. Mary Ellen E. Mordino Young from the University of Southern California. The title of her talk is not defined yet, but she, she integrates the lab of Dr. Antonio Damasio. So uh, she's gonna talk about the science of social learning, then the neuroscience of affective education and learning, which is a, a very trendy topic too. So we are very happy to, to have you here and we hope to, to see you in the next event. Okay, thank you very much. Aleda, you want thank to you, Lilia. Thank you all for being here today. I had a lot of passions. Those who were my students who took some courses with me will recall that we read uh, Justin Pratt when they brought first, I think they were first ones to bring to try to hypothesize and bring a theory on top of the results from fMRI. So she talked a lot about adaptability, right? This, uh, and she didn't mention that this was another question that I was going to ask, but it's okay, I can ask later <clears throat> about neural efficiency impact. These are all hypotheses brought by Marcel just. Uh, and Chantel Pratt in their lab, which they investigated L1, but I think this would be very important to be investigated in L2. So these would be avenues for research in L2. Okay, so I loved it. I hope you enjoyed it too. <laughs> and I hope to see you next time. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Yes. Thank you, Claudia, Sydney. Well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.